Hello, welcome. Today on Ask a Pastor, I'm joined by John Delansky, Dr. John Delancey. Uh, he's been a pastor in the Pittsburgh area for years, and then a few years ago left that to focus exclusively on education around Israel and the land, and uh, has uh, been a part of Orchard Hill for a couple of years now and also uh, led our last trip to Israel. And we will be taking another trip to Israel in the coming years in 2021, but there will be information that you can get about that on the show notes here of this podcast. If you're listening on the radio, if you go to orchardhillchurch.com, you can find information there. Uh, John led our trip uh, last year and just had a great response, leads trips uh, multiple times every year. You want to jump on one of this man's trips because you will learn about Israel in a way that you will not without seeing it, and it would be outstanding. Where, where did you get your doctorate from? I don't think I've ever asked you that. Uh, Trinity Seminary. Okay, actually. fantastic. Was it in, uh, like, how did you learn so much about uh, the physical land itself? Was it just always a passion, or did you uh, pursue formal education in that? Actually, I studied in Jerusalem for one year back okay. in, during my third year of college. Mm -hmm. And it was a great year. I was an archaeology student, learned a lot about historical geography. But from there, I really uh, sort of centered my educational experience around Israel-related themes. Okay. So probably one of the questions somebody asks, even if they just tuned in today and see, you know, questions about Israel is, so what? Like, like yeah, there's <laughs> the land out there. I get it. I get right. stuff at a physical place. But do I really need to know that if I know a little bit about who Jesus is, know a little bit about some of the Old Testament? Like, like why do I need more background on the physical land and the settings of the Bible? What, what would be your, your answer to that? Well, I always use the illustration of a playing board. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, if you were to learn to play the game of chess or Monopoly for the first time, you know, we can think back when we were kids and playing with grandpas or grandmas. Uh, the first thing that you have to do in order to play the game properly is to know how the playing board is, is oriented, mm -hmm. how it's laid out. Uh, we view the land of Israel as the playing board of the Bible. So in order for us to understand the Bible really in its context, using history, the geography, the topography, the regions, certainly biblical archaeology, that's all part of the physical settings of the Bible or the playing board. So in order for us to really learn and understand the Bible in its context, you have to know the playing board. So mm -hmm. that's why I think it's so important to learn the Bible. And as we teach the Bible through our ministry, that's what we do. We bring to life the physical settings of the, the land. So give us an example of something that when somebody reads in their Bible, where they read it, but then when they understand the setting or something about the topography, the geography, the geology, something that all of a sudden you read it differently and it changes either your appreciation or your full understanding of that. Well, let's take... Uh a common theme of the life and ministry of Jesus. Mm -hmm. He primarily served in the Galilee during his three or three and a half years of ministry. Uh, Capernaum was his main home base, if you will, for his ministry. But he grew up in a place called Nazareth. Now to understand the distance between Nazareth and Capernaum, uh, it's important because Jesus basically served uh, in the Galilee area at many, many sites uh, in that region. So to understand the hills, the topography, the, uh, the lake itself, the Sea of Galilee, mm -hmm. uh, some of the storm narratives that take place in Mark 4 and Matthew 14, for instance, to know uh, the topography of the lake and the settings or the context of those two miracles, it, mm. it helps us to gain an understanding of uh, how Jesus serve people, how we perform miracles, if we understand uh, distances, topography, even how uh, biblical sites were oriented, uh, what sites look like, for instance. So mm -hmm. we can use archaeology to determine, really, uh, the living conditions and the context of, of the life of Jesus. Okay. I, I know when... Uh when I came on the trip that you yeah. led, uh, one of the things that jumped at me that I knew intellectually, but I didn't 
probably appreciate fully was the significance of water. Mm. Uh, and so that has changed just for me when I read through the text now and I come to anything that has to do with water, uh, all of a sudden I, I see it and I feel it in a different way uh, because of having experienced uh, just a little bit of the desert and, and a little bit of how, uh, just even seeing some of the sites and the lengths that people went to to get and to store water and how significant it was for life. So for example, when I come to a, a verse like Jeremiah 2, uh, verse 13, I think it is where uh, the text says, you know, you've hewn for me cisterns. You've created two heirs. One, you've hewn your own cisterns, and then you've made them broken cisterns. Uh, all of a sudden, you, you see that differently because for those people, that would have communicated something so clear about how they were seeking life outside of Christ. But, but even though I could intellectually understand it, uh, to, to see it and feel it uh, created a different uh, level of experience. What, um, as if you were to to kind of say, okay, there's, there's you know, obviously an intellectual understanding. Um, so, so the life of Christ, understanding the context helps us. What would be some of the, the, the archeological facts that, that if you were speaking to somebody who is kind of skeptical about all of Christianity, that would help you or help somebody say, wow, this, this gives credence to, to Christian faith. I would probably go to the site of Jericho. In hmm. fact, you mentioned water. Well, there's a water spring there. In fact, Second Kings tells us that Elisha at one point restored and cleansed the water at Jericho. Mm -hmm. But Jericho is a classic site where we have some archaeology that uh, I think gives evidence of the conquest by Joshua, for instance. Mm -hmm. In fact, we can go to many other biblical sites where there are ruins that really testify to various uh, biblical stories that are mentioned both in the Old and the New Testament. But Jericho is a classic site because that site, when you look at the evidence, there's, um, there are still walls there that you can see. In fact, a stone wall we call a revetment wall, on top of which was a mud brick wall. And archaeologically, since the early 1900s all the way through the 50s, when that site has been excavated, uh, when you look at the evidence, all of that really ties perfectly with the biblical narrative of Joshua 6. Mm -hmm. So when people go, I'm not sure that the Bible is really historically accurate. I'm not sure if the story of Joshua 6 and the conquest of the land really took place you know, as the Bible states. Well, that's one example where we can say, yes, those walls date precisely to the time of Joshua. And therefore, every detail, in fact, uh, both in the 1930s and the 1950 excavations, at Jericho, they found uh, big jars, storage jars with burned wheat in it. Mm -hmm. And of course, that matches the, the description of the conquest of the city perfectly because uh, Jericho was one of three cities that were burned by Joshua mm -hmm. of the 31 total cities that he would actually conquer. So Jericho is a perfect example of how the Bible and archaeology really lines mm -hmm. up perfectly. Yeah, yeah, that was another thing that, that impressed me was just after a while going to different sites as a person who's not probably driven by archaeology, right. um, you start saying, well, it's another pile of rocks. <laughs> yeah, right. But the, the beauty of it was saying, wow, this gives more attestation to things that were written in the text that now you can see and feel and touch and are verified through uh, archaeological digs and finds. I, I would guess that a lot of times when you lead trips, people come and they go, wow, now the Bible makes more sense to me. I so appreciate it, you know, and just rave about the experience. What if somebody comes on a trip and their experience is this whole thing seems more goofy to me, not more <laughs> real, because, you know, okay, maybe I see Jericho, maybe that's convincing, but you get to Jerusalem, you have, you know, all these different faiths converging, everyone claiming that this is the holy spot, and to think, how would God choose this, and this kind of confusion, and this kind of um, just competing views as his way of self-revelation? What would, uh, how would you help somebody navigate that kind of a thought? Well, that's a great question, because there's many traditional sites that sort of throw you off track. A lot of traditional sites that say this happened here or this happened there. And really the traditional sites 
aren't genuine sites most of the time. So when you go as a first timer to Israel, sometimes it's hard to distinguish between what's a real site, archaeology is there, the Bible, the stories match up perfectly, but a lot of the traditional sites are just that. So uh, Jer Jerusalem's a good example of that because mm -hmm. it's a, really a, a wild place. It's a busy place. It's a mm -hmm. touristy place. Yeah. And certainly there's a convergence of Islam and Judaism as well as, of course, our Christian faith. But uh, when we consider, for instance, the life of Jesus, uh, the Temple Mount is still mm -hmm. there. And even though the Temple Mount is dominated by the Dome of the Rock, which was a structure built in 692 AD by the Muslims, that certainly uh, was the precise location of where Solomon built his first temple mm -hmm. and where Herod in 20 BC built the second temple, mm -hmm. actually expanded the, the temple built by Ezra and Nehemiah back in the Old Testament. But when you take a look at things that you can see in Jerusalem, for instance, uh, and then open the Bible to the Gospels. You know, Jesus was there probably five times during the course of his ministry. Um, but we can see a lot of evidence of real Herodian streets. The Temple Mount, the walls, the Western Wall mm -hmm. itself is evidence of uh, a structure that Jesus would have seen. So that's a real authentic site and certainly lo uh, authentic locations that we can pinpoint Jesus being at. Okay, so uh, fast forward to kind of our time because one of the other things that, that comes from visiting is you realize this isn't just a historical place, this is a current place right. with real political tensions, with, uh, with people you know, sitting just over the border um, you know, with, uh, with tensions between uh, people groups. How do you reconcile the the Christian idea um, for some of this is the the land the the chosen area with kind of the Zionistic impulses of people and then others who would say it seems that that any Zionist impulse um, roots some other people out of the land that became theirs uh, you know, how do you reconcile all of that that's another great question because there's so many political tensions today, even among Christian theologies, for instance, mm -hmm. there's people who would argue that the land is Israel and they are Zionistic in their perspectives uh, in terms of the land being Israel's property, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, whereas we also have other ethnic groups like Arabs who are now called Palestinians who are also claiming to have part of the land historically. So. It's, it's interesting to sort of make sense of all that. I personally think that uh, the land as promised to Abraham mm -hmm. uh, certainly gives credence uh, to the whole idea that the land historically from really from the days of Abraham 4,000 years ago, uh, the land was given to Israel. Uh, but when you understand even in the Jewish uh, mindset there are Jews, for instance, who are very Zionistic, who mm -hmm. think that the land is uh, an attestation of God's uh, fulfilled prophecy, for instance, in 1948 when it became a state, for instance. Mm -hmm. But there's other Jews or uh, sects, of, sects of Jews who would say the land is not really important at all. That's why we have a lot of uh, Orthodox Jews living in Brooklyn and Miami and so forth, where they're waiting for the Messiah to come and the land is sort of irrelevant to them. So mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that the question even can't be discerned completely or agreed upon even among the, uh, the Jewish mindset. Yeah. Um, speak just for a moment about, and again, modern um, Israel, the difference between um, the different Jewish kind of sects, so Orthodox, maybe religious, secular, um, you, you know, what are the other things in the modern world that, uh, that people need to understand about modern day uh, Judaism? Well, Israel doesn't have reformed and conservative Judaism like America does. Mm -hmm. They basically have nationalistic Jew, uh, Jewish uh, people who are primarily maybe more Zionistic, they view the land as significant. They 
uh, might uh, celebrate a, a festival or two, like Yom Kippur or Rosh Hashanah or Pesach for, sh for sure that we just uh, came through a couple weeks ago. Uh, then there are the Orthodox and the ultra-Orthodox communities. Now, they're a very small mi majority in Israel. Uh, I would say about 80 or 85 percent of Jews in Israel are, are secular, whereas maybe I would say 7 or 9 percent would be Orthodox and the rest would be ultra-Orthodox. The ultras would be dressed in their costumes, they would not shave the locks of their hair, they would wear uh, the tallit all the time, the, the small one that uh, mm -hmm. you can see. Uh, the, the threads or the tassels hanging all the time. They're all, always at the wall, for instance, praying. Mm -hmm. But um, it's a very small minority uh, of, of Judaism today. Pr I would say there's uh, worldwide about a little over 12 million Jews, mm -hmm. and about half of them now are in Israel, but only a small portion of them are either Orthodox or ultra-Orthodox. Okay. So if somebody says, you know, is listening uh, or has thought, I should learn more about this, but I don't see myself going on a trip. It's not the right time of life. I don't have the kind of resources to do that. What resources or ways would be helpful to them just to begin learning more about the physical setting of the Bible? Well, uh, on our or through our ministry, we offer a lot of resources, uh, not only videos, but some written resources that uh, might help to introduce people to the physical settings of the Bible. In fact, we even have a resource page uh, that lists, if you want to learn about the Hebraic background of Jesus, mm -hmm. there's uh, a number of books that come to mind. Uh, Our Father Abraham uh, and Jesus the Jewish Theologian. So that's a, a sort of a narrow part of learning context, but specifically about Jesus, those would be two great uh, books to begin with. In terms of learning the land, uh, there's there's a host of uh, good resources out there. My old professor from my Jerusalem days actually uh, produced something called Regions on the Run. Hmm. It can be found on bibback.com. It's a website that uh, he and another colleague of, of ours put together. But there you have a whole map manual. You can mark maps. You can read the Bible uh, as you uh, open up the map and, and just see movements and uh, uh, you learn the topography of the land that way. Um, for people who travel with me on our trips, I, I oftentimes suggest uh, these few resources as a way to begin orient, orienting yeah. themselves to, to this. And you have uh, on your website some video links to drone footage with some explanation videos that you're doing of the land as well, which would yeah. probably be a fantastic resource. Tell us about that. Yeah, we have a whole video page as well, and uh, the new series that we're just doing, in fact, we're filming some of it here in the chapel of uh, <laughs> the church, as you know, mm -hmm. is uh, it's a series called It Happened Here, Life Lessons from Israel. Mm -hmm. So I uh, basically introduce a site, and I sort of expose what the site means, archaeologically what's there, but uh, we do feature some new drone video that we have taken over the last year or so. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's uh, also accessible on the website and a good introduction to some of the, the biblical sites that are mentioned in the scripture. Okay. And you wrote a devotional as well, right? I did. So that has uh, like sites and then some insights into each of those. Tell us about that yeah. and how somebody could get that. The book is called Devotional Treasures from the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. and what we did is we took 73 sites and these are sites pretty much mentioned in the Bible. There's a few that are extra biblical, but uh, I took a look at them from historical, geographical, of course, archaeological, and scriptural point of view, and I blended that into a devotional thought and application. So uh, as we lead trips, not only just to help people gain new insights into the Bible, um, I think a big part of our ministry is to help people form and learn some life lessons along the way. So uh, it's a blend of the two, a little information as well as some spiritual formation as well. Okay, and if somebody wants to jump onto one of your trips, obviously I mentioned that Orchard Hill sure. will be having a trip in April of 2021. So tell somebody how they could get engaged in that. And then if they wanted to jump on a different trip, you lead trips to Greece and some other places, Turkey as well, uh, how they could find information and, uh, and be able to jump onto a trip that you're leading. 
Well, the website is biblicalisraeltours.com. And that's uh, the site where people can find uh, and discover all kinds of trips. In fact, because of the busyness of the tourism business now today in, in Israel, we are actually planning out all the way almost into 2021 already. Mm-hmm. So uh, we have a number of uh, biblical Israel tours that are already scheduled uh, through really November of 2020. Uh, we do offer Greece and Turkey trips. Uh, some of our Israel tours also include Jordan extensions as well as Egypt extensions. So that's uh, of interest to a lot of people who want to not just see Israel, but mm-hmm. of course Jordan is part of the land of the Bible as well. And of course we all know the biblical connections to Egypt uh, right. as well. Okay. All right, fantastic. Dr. John Delancey, thank you for joining us today. Thank and you. Uh, again, if you have questions for us on Ask a Pastor, you can send them to Ask a Pastor at OrchardHillChurch.com. If you're interested in this trip in 2021, it'll be in April, uh, Orchard Hill, be uh, all Orchard Hill kind of um, uh, opportunity to go. Uh, you can go to uh, the website of OrchardHillChurch.com. There should be a link that would lead you to uh, all the opportunity that's there. So thank you. Have a great day. 